Sunday, May 14, 2003. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show. We take a deep dive into the news of the week. You can support my work and get exclusive access to bonus content at patreon.com slash five minute. Joining us today is attorney, former federal prosecutor and former Republican official that now tracks and reports on the right wing. Ron Filipkowski, welcome back to The Weekend Show. Thank you. Great to be back. So you uh, have a huge following on Twitter, and you love to call stuff out as you see it, and I'm a, I'm a big fan, as you know, and we've Thank spoken you. before about five or six months ago. Uh, there's an awful lot to talk about today, so just to kind of look ahead, if we get time, I do want to talk about George Santos, who's uh, famous for fabricating his life story. He uh, pleaded guilty on Wednesday to charges that he duped donors, stole from his campaign, and lied to Congress about being... Being a millionaire is very hard to say this with a straight face, but uh, it's you know I mean it's serious, but he just is remarkable. So we'll we'll, we'll look at him. Uh, also, House Republicans have unveiled what they say are records of uh, ten million dollars in payments to members of the Biden family from foreign entities. We'll debunk that story, um, but first and probably as expected, it's only fair that we look at what happened earlier this week when uh, CNN bosses thought it was a good idea to give Donald Trump uh, an hour and 10 minutes of um, cable news time to basically say whatever he wanted to say. This was the town hall uh, that actually was more like a, a Trump campaign event, right? Like a televised rally. So uh, you on Twitter have been quite critical of the way, not just the, the, fir the reason for doing it in the first place, which we'll talk about and is still kind of evades me, but also the way that the host, Caitlin Collins, kind of handled Donald Trump. L let me ask you, first of all, do you think she was the right choice for doing a show such as this? Well, there's three parts to this. You know, there's the format itself. There's the, her style, the way that she approached the interview and there's the sub so i i take each thing separately what you've asked me now is about this which is what is she, did she have the right style and i tweeted this yesterday and lawrence o'donnell actually picked up on this with his opening monologue um he follows me on twitter so i don't i don't know if he saw it and i influenced what he said but you know what i pointed out was with with somebody like donald trump i think a traditional journalistic interview is inappropriate and not going to work i mean he's just this gaslight eyes and you know nobody's gonna say interrupt and be boorish the only way to approach an interview like that with trump is as an attorney doing a cross-examination and so i think really what you need is either a journalist who has those kinds of skills and those kinds of skills are difficult to acquire <laughs> i've cross-examined thousands of people in courtrooms and many people never get that skill it's it's difficult and so uh, there are some journalists who have it. Jonathan Swan comes to mind. Um, there, there's, there's a few, but it's rare. And that's really what you have to have. She clearly does not have those skills. So she was just, from a stylistic standpoint, completely in over her head. Um, I can just give you one example that I tweeted. Let's just take how to approach uh, his statements about people dying of fentanyl. People are dying of fentanyl overdose and it's because of our lax border enforcement. Well. Here's here's the way I would have approached it. I would have said, Mr. Trump, you're you're quite proud of your accomplishments as president. You say that you sort of we had a very secure border when you were president. Isn't that true? Oh, yes. He'll let him brag about the border. Oh, yes. And um, and you're saying that fentanyl deaths are caused by lax border security. It, you, you that's what you're blaming the fentanyl deaths in the United States on is our lax border. Yes. Well, uh, why did we have 57,000 fentanyl deaths in your final year in office? Let, let, so you're you effectively say? catching him. You're catching him. Propaganda. Yeah. Right. You can over and over and over like that. You, you don't go, do you believe that you won the 2020 election? Yeah. No, it was fraudulent. It was stolen. The, this, whole, this whole notion of fact checking in real time is absurd with Donald Trump. I mean, to, what do you, so what did she come back with? Well, you lost every court case. Well, you know. Not, this is not yeah. a cross there was, nothing, there was nothing clever about it. Like there no. was, there was, no, there was no kind of skill involved. But I, I think it's important though that we don't um, kind of rubbish Caitlin Collins too much because yeah. she was just a lamb to the slaughter, right? She was, she was I put agree. in a very difficult position. 
um and she's you know it's it's not it's not her fault if if i was doing the casting i probably would have put a, a man the same age as donald trump in there you know so that there was some kind of equality in terms of that kind of to and fro because we know that he doesn't respect women we know that you know he i mean maybe he asked for her you know maybe he said i'll only do it if there's I, a republican audience you. and and you know caitlin collins is the host i watched his interview when it was announced Okay, and, and I think this is the other thing you have to have. You have to have somebody who pays attention to Donald Trump. And a lot of people don't like to do that. Where can you find Donald Trump over the years? Obscure podcasts, people that you've never heard of. Trump goes on these things these things every yeah, day. All the time, yeah. But but people like Caitlin Collins don't watch those. People like me do. I watch all of them. So I'm very familiar with his line of attack and his approach, and I know what he's gonna say, and I just think that a lot of journalists, the last time they've really seen or heard from Donald Trump very much was 2020. And, and that's their reference point when you have this cornucopia of things that he says every day that are just insane that they've completely ignored and that never come up. And, and it, that's the frustrating thing for me is I hear all of these things that, that he says every day and yet the media seems oblivious to them. Uh, I don't know if it's a conscious decision to ignore what he's saying. But look, this is the front runner for the Republican nomination. You damn well better start paying attention. But this is a problem, isn't it? That people were very tired of his voice and they were very tired of his rhetoric. And a lot of people just didn't want to hear it anymore. And right. I kept saying, you know, tire of this guy because this is where the, the, the danger sets in because he wants you to tire of him because then, you know, uh, uh, the apathy uh, becomes, a, becomes a factor. And the reality is, you and I are the same. I'm addicted to Donald Trump, you know? I, I think he is a disgusting fascist individual. Um, and I'm not a Democrat and I don't get to vote in this country, but I believe in, you know, I'm, I'm vehemently pro-democracy and I believe that the Republicans deserve proper representation. And he is not it because he is against America. He's not just against Democrats, he's against America. And, and so I watch, like you, and I absorb uh, everything that he does, which means that people like us, and there's plenty of us, I'm, I'm far better placed to understand him as the psychiatrists are doing and the body language experts, uh, as well as the political analysts. Yeah. Um, on the substance, I yeah. mean, it's out these darkroom policy uh, videos, right, which he pre-records and they're scripted and they're mostly being written by Stephen Miller and and right. with some Jason Miller mixed in and they're very draconian uh you know in the uh, in the shadows with flags stuff. behind him yeah, yeah they're kind of dystopian videos yeah yeah and what he's saying is just one crazy thing after another the media doesn't cover these they don't put them on TV i think the media has this strategy cover him or we won't put his policy pronouncements out but to me the policy pronouncements are the craziest thing about donald right now i mean when he wants to as president require every school district to hold an election every year for their local school principals so you could have just pack construction worker run for the elementary school principal and get elected by the parents this is what he says he wants to do that aside you could ask well how does the president have the authority to do that they have no authority to do it but you know the point is is that trump doesn't understand any of these policies that he's talking about because they're written by other people so he if probably you pin doesn't him even down, read them does he, he probably he just, just reads stands the there and reads the teleprompter yeah and doesn't know so what if you he's ask reading. him well how is this going to work exactly he can't answer yeah. those questions so why wouldn't you ask them yeah it's it's so interesting that you really do have to become an expert on him to interview him i think that's what you're saying and yes. and, and she is definitely not an expert um, well her expertise is like 2020 expertise it's not yeah. recent so yeah. all they have to do is ask him about j6 and the elections and the court cases and that's pretty much it well that's pretty boring to most of the american people to be honest with you Let, let's just go let's just go back a bit because i want to talk about whether or not it was a good idea for cnn to yeah. even do this in the first place you know and there's been a lot of backlash there's been a lot of criticism and the new boss of cnn 
has come out and he's kind of gone the other way. He, he's basically made a statement that suggested that this was, was great work. You know, he, he, his name's Chris Litch. He uh, saluted what he called a masterful performance by Caitlin Collins. Um, and he, he, he said that you do not have to like the former president's answers. That's his kind of argument here. How, how dangerous a decision was it? to actually give platform in the first place. I'll just, I don't want to beat up on Caitlin Collins either. I do want to touch on that. Is I, I think what Caitlin Collins basically like making me go argue an immigration case. You know, a lawyer, but I don't know anything about immigration very much, so I'm not going to look very good. So I, I agree with what you said there. As far as uh, platforming him, look, I'm someone who platforms Donald Trump, okay? And I get criticized a lot for that. But I do it in a, in a, I think, a selective, intelligent way that presents him in a less than favorable light. So I think I don't have an issue with them doing this, especially considering he, he's a front runner for the nomination. But I think the town hall idea was a, a horrible mistake. I mean, if you look at Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump, they have a very similar way of going about this. They like to intimidate the press. At the rallies, at their events, they like their fans to intimidate the press, to heckle them, to yell at them, to cheer, cheer their answers. DeSantis does it. Trump does it. And so you put her in the position where she's not only got to deal with Trump, she's got to deal with Trump fans heckling her and giving her a hard time and laughing. And that just made it incredibly more difficult. So, so you can't do like this traditional town hall like you could have done with John McCain with this guy and MAGA. You know, it just doesn't work. And they should have understood you, you audience to say, okay, because they there were some undecided in there, but didn't really see that. And seven of the nine questions that were asked were all pretty much, you know, kind of sycophantic questions towards the, the, right. the disgrace. Who, whose idea do you think that was? And what was the thinking behind it? I think they probably ran different formats by him, and this is the one he latched on. I, I, I was about to say, I heard when, when the, it was first announced, he said he was very pleased with the choice of Caitlin Collins as the moderator. So yeah. I said, oh, that's not, yeah. not good. So I think they may have run by him uh, a, a number of different names of moderators and a number of different formats, and I think let him have a, have a say in, in, in this. He because she did, very she did preempt the interview by saying, now we haven't prearranged any questions. And, and I thought that was interesting. And he said, yes, we haven't. And, and that, I thought that was interesting because obviously I know about the way these shows work and there's always a rider. There's always an agreement. So maybe he didn't you know, turn down any questions, but he did say, I want this kind of audience and I want this host. So sometimes there's a bit of you know, tit for tat. Donald Trump's weakness is his recklessness and his 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 lack of fear about those things. I believe that he didn't know what. Look, Donald Trump doesn't care. He'll take he takes impromptu questions. He'll stand up in a press conference and take two hours of questions as president. He's not afraid of that. So because he thinks that he can dominate the 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 atmosphere, he can dominate the space. So I believe that part of it. I I believe he knew he had a friendly crowd. He knew he had the right interviewer. He didn't care what the questions were. He was comfortable that he could handle it. Let's just talk about the questions because you've been writing some alternative questions on, on Twitter, which I, I've been completely uh, kind of, I've just been enjoying them so much because, you know, the, and you, you, you wrote, you said, look, I'm not a journalist. I, you know, this isn't my area of expertise, but it seems to me that there are some very simple questions that you can ask this guy that are going to enable you to kind of get the, the answers or, or at least expose him for having no idea about what it is. Let's just kind of pick a few of those of your favorites because you put sure. a, a, at least a dozen now. I mean, start with him. Well, I would start with the question I started out with about about the COVID vaccine. Look, here here's what you can do. This is the Republican, right? That's that's what to justify this. Well, there are many positions that Donald Trump has taken in the past year that his base do not like. See, I'm aware of that because I yeah. follow his and the, the vaccine I go to his the, route. The most, yeah. So I know what those things are. So I would have asked, started out by asking him a question that I know how he's going to answer it and I know the audience is not going to like it. 
And that's going to set the tone right there. He may have even gotten booed. And, and that would have thrown him off his game completely. So what do we know about... And, and the reason why he's saying these things is because he's already looking ahead to the general election. He's already thinks he's got this primary pretty much wrapped up. So he's starting to moderate a little with his look. So I would ask him, he, one of his things that he's most proud of is the COVID vaccine, Operation Warp Speed, which he says yeah. he saved millions of lives himself, right? Yeah. So I would get him bragging about that because MAGA base hates when he talks about the vaccines. They they have booed him before when he's brought up the vaccines. So I would have started out the first question, Mr. Trump, do you believe that the COVID vaccines that were approved during your administration were safe and effective? Because I know that audience wants him to say no, and I yeah. know he's going to say yes. he can't yes. do it because he took the vaccines himself, famously, and yep. he, is, he is somebody that they revere but there are always going to be policy issues that not everyone is going to agree on so call right. him out for those right. um on abortion he refused to be kind of held down didn't he you know he to make a decision what's best for the country he blames what happened in the midterms on abortion okay he doesn't blame himself for endorsing and choosing poor candidates so his cop out, his default is abortion. We lost because we were too militant about abortion. So he is already he said he's made he's made several states of abortion, basically advising Republicans, you know, and 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 to leave it up to the states. Well, here's the problem: his base is pro life. His base believes abortion is murder. Donald Trump does not believe that. Okay, Donald Trump doesn't want to talk about abortion. So what I would do is, again, put a wedge between him and his base. Donald Trump, do you believe do you believe that abortion should be left up to each state to decide? He would answer that question, yes, because he said that many times. Yeah. He, I would want to leave it up to the states. I wanted to get Roe overturned for that reason. Do you also believe that abortion is murder? Well, yes, I do, because he has to say that, too. Well, wait a minute. So it's okay for you murder of an infant child be legal that's okay with you mr trump and, and i'm driving a wedge between him and the evangelicals because look the deal that he made with the evangelicals is over with the deal he made is they would hold their nose and vote for this guy who they don't particularly like because he's going to put three justices on the supreme court to overturn roe well that's done that deal's over with they got yeah. what they wanted he so he's got to make a new bargain well. with them yeah, he, he said, I did row. You know, he, he, he yeah. tried to take the credit That's for that. water under the bridge. He then started to peddle this lie about Democrats who like to abort babies at seven or eight or nine months or even after, after they've birth. been born. And then he said that Democrats execute babies. I mean, I, I, where does this stuff even come from? I mean, how has this been allowed to it, become it, a thing? It comes from who he listens to, which is the very far right fringes of the Internet. And yeah. that's who he, he listens to these days. It's his Achilles heel. And that's what you have to do. You have to continue to to go at him with what his followers believe. Which are some crazy extreme. You need to say Donald Trump. Your believers believe that COVID was intentionally unleashed on the world by the Chinese Communist Party in order to defeat you as president. This is what 20, 30 percent of his base believes that. Do you believe that, Mr. Trump? So either he's going to say, no, I think that 20 percent of my base is nuts or I'm going to agree with them and everybody else is going to think he's nuts. You can keep doing that with abortion. He, he comes up, he hears these crazy things from his son and from Stephen Miller, and he repeats yeah. them, but he doesn't know what he's talking about. So you have to pin him down. You have to say, Mr. Trump, where is this happening? Where are babies being executed by their mothers in hospitals? What states? Which politician believes that that should be legal? Does Joe Biden think that should be legal? These are the questions that must be asked. That's why it's so frustrating for me to have watched that nonsense Ron, it was frustrating for all of us I actually, I actually
I came, I came back. back to, I couldn't. Even, it was. I couldn't. I couldn't handle it. Um, that none of this uh, interrogation is done. Does it suggest to you that it wasn't done because they didn't want to? Because you know CNN's ownership is now very much on the on on, on to the right of centre. They're trying to get views. Viewers. They're trying to win back. They lost to Fox, and that really, this was just about circus sensationally. I mean, there's a rumor that he, the the boss, the new boss of CNN, actually said to Trump before the show, "Just go out there and have fun." Yeah, but but see, you can do things like that. And I mean, as a trial lawyer, look, I've said that to my before. I'm gonna off, you know. You want them to let their guard down, relaxed. I mean, so no, I don't really, I don't really buy into the fact that CNN is trying to be Fox. I'm sure they would like to have some of the Fox viewers, um, and I think to some extent they are trying to do that. They're, they're definitely trying to move away from where they were in 2020 and 2019, which was definitely an anti-Trump network, and try and play it more, more straight news. And I don't have an issue with that. But I really think it's more of an issue of negligence. And the reason why I believe that is because it's not just CNN. I mean, I, I see this across all networks about their, their lack of understanding about what is happening in the MAGA movement. Because we also tend to over-focus on Trump and not focus on the people influencing Trump and the people behind Trump and putting ideas and words and in his mouth and in his head. And I think you can't understand Trump without understanding the movement behind him. And this is where many journalists, they don't get that, you know? Would I, would I be right in saying that the only original idea that Trump has ever had is Space Force? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't well, think he has I saw many, him, I he doesn't have many original ideas. He yeah, doesn't. I mean, he, he, he yeah. relies on, originally yeah. it was Steve Bannon, now, as you That's said, right. you've got the, the Stephen Millers and, and, and the likes. And, and, and just, you know, about who people like Stephen Miller are. I mean, these are far-right, mm -hmm. very dangerous, extremist Christian nationalists. These people are, are not uh, your kind of run-of-the-mill run uh, political advisors by any I just by any posted way. an hour ago Stephen Miller running a commercial for people to hire him as an attorney if you're white and discriminated against because you're white he's running yeah. ads for, i mean that's who we're talking about yeah Let's talk about what happened the day before this uh, TV uh, event, and that was Trump being found liable for sexual abuse and defamation in the E. Jean Carroll trial, and he had to cough up five million dollars. The very next day, he's on the television being treated like a superstar, and then he goes on to defame E. Jean Carroll even more and re refers to her in, in the most disgraceful language and apparently she's going to now sue him again. I mean, I think, I think that shocked a lot of people, but yeah. I hear him say this stuff five times a day. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I thought that that was the best part of the town hall as far as hurting him goes, yeah. especially with women. Yeah. Um, I think that that hurt him, you know, his, his way he handled that. And I've heard that from from some of uh, a broad spectrum of people. Um, so yeah, I think but it that wasn't that was... it wasn't very good for E. Jean Carroll watching or any of the twenty six women that have accused him of sexual assault. No. And 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 this is the problem, isn't it? That he just doesn't care. I mean, he was asked about this Access Hollywood moment as well, you know, and, and about and he yeah. still Gave doubled down. Answer. Women just let you do it when you're famous. They just let you do it. I mean. I mean, this is year. This is this is like years on from him, from that tape being released. Twenty sixteen, that tape came out. Didn't hurt him as president, and he's still using it as a campaign vehicle. I think that a lot of people like us would, 
we watch something like that and we're just horrified and shocked. But what, what I think we don't really understand it, it until we actually see it is there are actually people who love Donald Trump because of the Access Hollywood tape. Right. They like the rogue. They like the the boorish. I'm a star. You know, want to be select. They they like they like the machismo. This is what they love about Trump. So he's not going to go move away from that because that's what his people like about him. But they also like the fact that he's a fraudster. They also like the fact that he's a liar. They also like the fact that he paints himself as a kind of anti-politician and anti-establishment and, you know, anti-deep state and all of these things that are far from the truth. I mean, he is establishment. You know, he is a, the people he used to hang out with, the, the Jeffrey Epsteins of this world, I mean, those are his people, not, not his base. He has no, he has no common ground with them at all. What's interesting is to watch the DeSantis people um, on social media make these arguments which is, well, if he's really, when they're fighting between themselves, the DeSantis people and the Trump people, and I'm, of course, in the middle of stirring the pot of all of that. And, and so what I love is when they say, well, you keep telling us he's this deep state fighter. What, what did he do? You know, he, yeah. he didn't do anything as president to fight the deep state. You keep telling us all these things he's going to do in his next term. Why didn't he do it in his first term? You know, and then they come up with excuse after excuse. But that... That's why the DeSantis running is just going to change the whole dynamic because it's not just the two of them fighting. It's the people who follow them fighting with each other that is important to break up this movement. It, this the notion of splitting the vote. I mean, this is something that a lot of people talk about, especially with Nikki Haley throwing her hat into the ring. And, and, and you know, I'm sure Mike Pence is going to show up soon and do the same thing. You know, this is this is. At this stage, you know, before the primaries, how, how much do you think it kind of changes the, the the thinking of Republican voters? Is there any chance that the stuff that Nikki Haley says, for example, which is quite anti-Trump in in many ways, you know, she tries to she's much much more measured and to kind of set the record straight. We have a senior position. You know, in, in do you think it educates Republican voters who might give her a listen that there is kind of a, a whole world outside of Trumpism? I, the market for that is pretty small, and I, yeah. I don't think she's necessarily the right messenger. I mean, it, it, DeSantis could be, but, you know, DeSantis, um, I think it was Charlie Sykes or Tim Miller for The Bulwark wrote a really good column about this about how DeSantis could go after the anti-Trump establishment Republicans, but he's not doing it. I mean, that's that's the mystery to everyone. And I think even his backers and his donors, it's a mystery to them, which is he appears to want to fight with Trump over the MAGA base. And, you know, he's not going to he's not going to get a big chunk of that. He really needs to change his approach and go after the moderates and the establishments. But I think He's not comfortable doing that or he doesn't know how, um, but he's certainly got enough advisors around him like Karl Rove who can help him do that. That's the smart play because if he captures those Nikki Haley, you know, type voters uh, and puts them with his other voters, I think he could beat Trump. I, I think in an electoral college strategy, I, I definitely believe he can beat Trump if he does it the right way. But I'm not really seeing that he that he wants to do it the right way. But the one guy I think who I'd want to see run because I really think he's the guy who gets under Trump's skin is um, New Jersey, uh, uh, former governor of New Jersey. Why am I drawing a blank on his name? Chris Christie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Chris Christie really knows how to bother Trump and get under him. Yeah. And Christie would have no chance whatsoever of winning anything, but he will annoy Trump. Yeah, he, has a, he puts a good argument for doesn't he yeah. he's kind of you yeah. could take him on Nicky there's somebody won't. else who who's going to take him on potentially between now and 2024 and that's jack smith yeah. you know if, if if jack smith gets his way as the as the special jack there's smith a very good chance, very good chance that trump won't even be in the race i mean yeah. what do you think the chances are of that happening yeah i think that's why DeSantis. everybody's saying oh DeSantis. all the trump people are like DeSantis is crazy you know he can't beat trump we well, can't beat trump tomorrow 
But, you know, when Jack Smith indicts Trump for 40 felonies in in six, seven months, it's a whole different ball game now. And that's what DeSantis this is banking on that. And I think he knows that's going to happen. I think most people know, intelligent people know that's going to happen. And that's going to change the dynamic of the race. Is it going to cause the most rabid Trump MAGA supporters to back off of him? No. That's 25% here. You know, I mean, there's plenty. Plenty of other people that will go, you know, we want to win. And and right now, that's the most persuasive argument with the Republican base is Trump is a loser. Trump loses. He won one time, but lost us. Not only does he lose himself, he loses for the, the rest of us lose because of him. And so this is the DeSantis argument of if we try and go forward with a nominee who's under 40 federal indictments, we are going to lose. We can't do this. DeSantis is, he might be his own worst enemy, Ron, because he's taking his Florida brand of politics and, and wants to kind of spread that around the, the country nationally. And, you know, Fl Florida is, is not California. Florida is, in fact, Florida is not anywhere, really, is it? Florida <laughs> is kind of its own, its own place. And if you buy into that world, in fact, there's a lot of Californians, Republican Californians, moving to Florida because of the climate. And they can, they'll still see palm, but you know they won't pay tax. Do you think think that he, that he this his plan might backfire? Stage, Anthony. I was one of those Californians who moved to Florida. I mean, uh, <laughs> way back what many years ago. But yeah, I moved from San Diego to Florida. You know, cheap, cheaper, low tax. Yeah, I mean, I've been here thirty years in Florida now, and been a, for most of that active in the Florida Republican Party. And I can tell you over the last three years, this state has gone undergone a transformation politically. And it's because of what you said. It's that during COVID, a huge influx, at least a million people, moved into Florida from northern states, from western states, who are mostly conservative Republicans who moved here because they chafed at COVID restrictions in those northern states. And so they wanted to come here where DeSantis was advertising. This is the free state of Florida. You can come here and do whatever you want. We have no rules. And so what that's done is completely transform the state politically. My town where I live, Sarasota, has always been a 52-48 uh, county. Now it's 60-40, you know, Republican. So it's, it's, it, that's why I've sort of written off Florida as a, as a Democrat now. I don't believe we can win here. I think... It, our our time and resources are better focused in Georgia, and Arizona, Pennsylvania, Michigan. You know, forget Florida; <laughs> it's lost. He's picked a fight with Disney, as we know, which is foolish because they're going to in, they're planning to invest, you know, eleven or fifteen billion dollars over the next ten years in Florida, and he'd be foolish to turn that down. But it's now come out that this kind of special jurisdiction, which he's kind of fighting against, to, to take that away from Disney, it's identical with say the village example which is this giant retirement in florida where you know older people move to to live out their final years in in a bungalow and yet he's not picking a fight with that special jurisdiction i mean do you think that the do you think he'll eventually drop the mouse because it, it, he's not going to win is he I think that I've said this on Twitter, he's going to drop his fight with Disney as soon as he's his presidential campaign. You know, that that's the only reason he picked the fight is for this purpose, for an applause line. It's it's the only reason why he went to Israel. It's the reason why he went to Japan is because he needs a line in a speech. It's the reason why he sent migrants to um, Martha's Vineyard, like things that have no substance, but he gets applause when he goes to Doug Mastriano's rally in Pennsylvania when Mastriano's running for governor the day after he deported the, the migrants to Martha's Vineyard. And he says, yesterday I shipped 50 migrants up to Barack Obama's summer home and they all stand and cheer. And that makes it worth every penny to him. So, and the Disney thing is the same thing. Um, I stopped, you know, I'm fighting woke Disney. But look, the second he's not running for president anymore, he doesn't need to carry on. And, and th these are fights, by the way, 
that his fellow Florida Republicans in the House and Senate here do not want to have this fight. They want they have no interest in this fight with Disney. You know, I think that fake outrage is a theme of of Republicans, isn't it? And and yeah. that's something we're gonna we're gonna take a break quickly for our sponsor. But I I want to come back and talk about this idea of fake outrage and 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 Hunter Biden's laptop, which you could argue has been. <laughs> the last six years of fake outrage. So we'll, sure. we'll, we'll, we'll do that in just a moment here on The Weekend Show. Cold turkey may be great on sandwiches, but there's a better way to break your bad habits. We're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your wacky neighbor or some sketchy message board. We're talking about our sponsor, Fume, and they look at the problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of a drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, award-nominated device that does just that. Instead of electronics, Fume is completely natural. Instead of vapor, Fume uses flavored air. And instead of harmful chemicals, Fume uses all natural, delicious flavors. You get it. Instead of bad, Fume is good. It's a habit you're free to enjoy and makes replacing your bad habit easy. Your fume comes with an adjustable airflow dial that is designed with movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is helpful for de-stressing and anxiety while breaking your habit. I gave a fume to my sister and she was shocked at how flavorful and fresh it tasted. It's easy to hold and perfectly balanced and quite honestly, extremely fun to fidget with. The real wood material and sleek design definitely classes it up and she feels pretty cool holding it. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard, but switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 100,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code WEEKEND to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code WEEKEND to save an additional 10% off your order today. Support for The Weekend Show is brought to you by Manscaped, who has the best in men's below-the-waist grooming products. That's right, their products are precision-engineered tools for your family jewel. Join over 8 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you, 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code WEEKEND20 at manscaped.com. Look, everyone knows you have to be careful when dealing with the family jewels. You definitely don't want to use an old, crusty electric trimmer. That's why I'm excited to partner with Manscaped. Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has arrived and it's a game changer. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, Crop Preserver ball deodorant, Crop Reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold all of those goodies. First off, the 4.0, the trimmer, it's uh, the future of grooming and dare I say the greatest family jewels trimmer ever. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof, also has an LED spotlight that you'll need for a more precise shave. And because this trimmer is waterproof, you can say goodbye to the mess on the bathroom floor. You thought that was good, but want to take your grooming game even further to the next level package 4.0 also includes the weed whacker nose and ear hair trimmer the weed whacker is also waterproof and provides proprietary skin safe technology which helps reduce nicks snags and tugs in those delicate nose holes their crop preserver deer crop reviver toner will change the way you approach your hygiene routine manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their performance package the Manscaped and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort and boxes to another level. It's time to take care of yourself, so go to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with code WEEKEND20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code WEEKEND20. 
Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. We're back with Ron Filipkowski. Uh, the House Republicans have unveiled what they say are records of $10 million in payments to members of the Biden family from foreign entities. This is the Oversight Committee Chair James Comer said Biden's relatives had used the family name to enrich themselves and the president was involved. Except he wasn't involved. Uh, the White House has called the findings baseless innuendo. The, the media is not really covering this story because... You know, it's been invested. He's well, Hunter Biden's been investigated for five years, and nothing really has been found. They really are faking outrage here. Tell tell us a little more about this story. I have some advice for Joe Biden, <laughs> unsolicited, for the Biden campaign, and for Democrats in general, and and for the media on this because I've been, I obviously am on all the different social media platforms, all the right wing, fringy platforms and stuff. So. I saw all the Hunter Biden laptop stuff in 2020 and throughout 2021, all the videos, all the documents. I'm very familiar with what we're talking about out here um, and what, what they're talking about, which largely the reason why most Americans aren't is because the media hasn't covered it. And, and that and what I will say is this. Do not defend Hunter Biden. This is my advice. And, and Joe stepped into this trap in his last interview where he was asked about this and he said I, I what he needs to say is look this is my son i'm standing by my son you know uh, and and i'm going to keep it it's a pending investigation and i'm going to keep it at that he needs to say well, other than i'm a dad i love my son but he went one step further and of course republicans jumped all over it which is he said my son did nothing wrong now i can just tell you anthony having seen everything on the laptop most of them his son did plenty wrong Hunter Biden is no saint, okay? Hunter Biden is a was very hooked on drugs, did a lot of crazy, wild stuff, a lot of illegal stuff, I believe, and I think he's going to be indicted. And so you don't want Joe Biden, I don't want my president's, my party's nominee, I don't want this race decided by Hunter Biden's character. Okay, so who, it's, who has it's, never played a part in the administration? It's just not it's, it's smart not like for Trump's Democrats. Kids. Yeah, to Trump's kids Hunter. were very much in the in the White House. They were part of the. Right. They were presidential advisors. Exactly. They had responsibilities. Hunter Biden has not been allowed anywhere near the White House. And it's yet, not smart to defend yeah. Hunter Biden. You, what what the defense is is what I say all the time, which is what do you have on Joe? Because there's nothing there on Joe. Yeah. I've seen it all. There's yeah. nothing there. It's all Hunter. So, okay, the president's son is a piece of garbage. Okay, if that's so what? Who cares? He's not in he's not running for anything. So, when you have something on Joe, get back to me. You know? But isn't and they don't part of the problem that that because Trump did turn the White House into a family business. There is a kind of projection on behalf of Republicans to think, well, Therefore, Hunter must be involved in Joe's uh, presidential work because he's the son in the same way that Jared Kushner is the son-in-law and, and Eric and Don Jr. were always very much and also I Ivanka very much involved. So there's this element of projection in the same way that there's kind of Republican projection about the attorney general being a kind of insider work Biden doing Biden's uh, dealing, which is not the case. But when, when I think their, their main argument uh, that Joe had to have been doing something for Hunter to get all these, this money, to get all yeah. these deals, that Hunter had no power, Hunter had no authority, he could do much for these companies only, but the problem with that is Joe was vice president. <laughs> what can the vice president do, you know, to help Burisma or help a Chinese company? Not a whole lot. And and the other problem is there's no evidence whatsoever that he ever did do anything. And, and Comer was asked point blank uh, two days ago, 
What did, can you point to one single thing that you think Joe Biden did as vice president that helped out one of Hunter's clients? Nothing. They got nothing. And that's the defense. You know, and, don't and, defend and, Hunter Biden. <laughs> but the, the, the laptop, this kind of laptop, which is really kind of the linchpin of the Republican policy for, for it's all they've got, right? It's just this laptop. It's Pizzagate, isn't it? It's become yeah. a, it's become a kind of myth. It's yeah. one of these one of these kind of cult like myths that is going to be ether forever. But when you actually look into it, it, it any connection with politics or the presidency no. or the government or the government. No. So they're not going to drop the hundred laptop um, rhetoric, are they? I mean, they're oh, now going to run. What they, here's what they know. They know that it gets under Joe's skin because Joe loves his son deeply. And Joe has been through a tough time with his other, you know, he's had sons die and, be, and he's had his, a wife killed in a car accident. You know, they know that Joe is protective and sensitive about this subject. They want to get under his skin and this is the way they, they see that they can do it. And I just think Joe would be very wise to just say, I love my son and that's all I'm going to say, you know. It's very dark, isn't it, that a political party would use such personal jabs to try and score points in this way to take advantage of because joe biden is a good person right he spent his life you might not agree with everything he's done and you know he got into trouble with busing years ago and but he, he was a public defender right he he has always he has committed and devoted his life to public service you couldn't say the same for donald trump right yeah, his his record is an open book. There's there's very few secrets with Joe Biden. You know, everything's out there. The things that Democrats have had a problem with him, you know, back in the 70s, the busing, the, the crime bill of 94, which was very tough, that got brought up a lot during his primary. Um, Presiding yeah, over Thomas's uh, yeah, Clarence uh, Thomas nomination. Yeah. But it's all out in the open. Everybody knows about it. There's no yeah. secrets. You know? It's 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 this idea of fake outrage is something that's kind of new to me that I'm kind of getting my head around. Uh, and Ted Cruz is the king of this, isn't he? He's somebody who, he he says something that is controversial and outrageous, and then, then he is filmed check while sitting in the Senate to see how to many see likes he got. Right? Yes, he does. <laughs> to see the reaction. I mean, with your experience with with being on the Republicans, uh, some might call it the, the dark side of the force, is it the case that, that now you see Republicans as baddies and them as goodies. I mean, is it as simple as that? Because a lot of the a lot of the um, processes that Republicans use, like this faux outrage, are really there's there's no goodness associated with this. This is this is bad stuff. This is dark stuff. This is really unhealthy just for humanity. And yet these are the types of they apply time and time again. And and Democrats don't read really tricks in the same way do they yeah and another big thing that kind of dovetails into this is the uh the owning the libs kind of thing you know something that really quite honestly i don't recall this existing in the republican party as a thing you know five years ago pre-trump um to where you want to you you revel when liberals are upset <laughs> when liberals yeah. cry when liberals are depressed or when something bothers them that makes you happy you know this is this is the owning the libs and i see this every day with them you know they the the cnn uh town hall i mean they're in all their glory not because they thought the town hall was especially great they love the liberal reaction to the town hall yeah the fact that Hugely. we're all so upset by the town hall this is what they like most about it you know? marjorie taylor green posted a picture of her on the phone laughing about the town right. hall because she could gloat about the fact that it was a win for Trump and that the snowflakes were were struggling and suffering. Yep. The problem with owning the libs as your as your kind of modus operandi is that when it gets as serious as not approving a ra a, a, you know, raising the debt, the, the debt ceiling, because you mm. want to own the libs and then crashing the US economy economy yes. and crashing the stock market having a knock-on effect around the whole world economy i mean that's kind of irresponsible isn't it 
Trump has been trying to get the Republicans in Congress to not raise the debt ceiling since he left office. And I've chronicled this. I've posted it. Oh, every time this has come up for a vote, Trump is out there yelling and screaming, don't do it, don't do it. And then a deal gets reached. Usually Mitch McConnell is the one who makes the deal. And then he screams about Mitch McConnell and how terrible he is. You know, the reason why Trump, because Trump would, Trump wants to burn the whole house down of the ashes. But Trump views is that the worst things get in this country, and he's constantly complaining how everything's going to hell, right? Yeah. That the worse the economy is, the better it is for Donald Trump. Yeah. Right? Because it makes he him look like the a, economy a good tank. Yeah. Yeah. He's rooting for that. And so what's the best way to accomplish a recession into the presidential election year? It's this. He doesn't care that it's bad for the country. It's good for him personally. And so that, that's the problem is you now have people like Green and even McCarthy who, have, who are now going along with this. The senators don't seem to want to go along with it. There's only eight or nine that that do but it seems like they have enough votes but you have to be you know. pretty sick you have to pretty much hate the country as much as you hate democrats to want to take action like this that is going to have a knock-on effect for years and 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 cause hardship for millions it, 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 it's just I, can't, I cannot get my head around how unwell I have to put it down to mental health because I just didn't know people could be that evil. I mean, yeah. and, and yet in the next breath, he's hugging the flag and pretending to be patriotic. If you're a true patriot and if you are part of the government, you know, and I see, and this is only my experience coming from Europe, you know, even if you're in opposition, you're still involved in the government. The government is important. It's trying to make life better for everybody. And a healthy opposition is part of democracy. But to purposely crash the economy to make the pre the, the the former guy look good i mean that is some that is some dark stuff well it goes back to COVID. you know look just to see his psyche he he truly believes that COVID was done to sabotage him personally hurt the world it hurt these more than anybody yeah. i mean the chinese suffered because of COVID. Yeah. so the idea that in this he believes this that they released this virus intentionally to hurt his re-election chances this is what he truly thinks that's how sick he is so once you understand that it's easy to understand how how he would want to if it goes back to our first conversation about the responsibility that networks have like cnn to not platform this guy because they know how unwell he is. They know how dangerous he is. They know that he is going to double down on things that are not just for the U.S., but for the whole planet, you know, because America really is considered to be the, one of the greatest functioning democracies, or it certainly was until 20, you know, 2020, when he started to rubbish it. I mean, the the knock on effect you could argue that, that the war on ukraine is as a result of donald trump's yes uh, language and misdemeanors there are so many things you can identify around the world jair bolsonaro in brazil or victor orban mm -hmm. these people are all influenced by donald trump and his fascist leanings but also his insanity and and therefore cnn really bit off more than they could chew yeah I mean, he says he could end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours. Yeah. How do you not ask him about that? How do you not pin him down on that? Yeah. My question, okay, what does that mean? Is the peace that you envision, you know, what she said is, who do you want to win? All right, what, fine. What that, kind of a question I mean, is that? All right, whatever. Here's what I would have asked. Yeah. Is your peace settlement, it, does that mean that Russia would have to return to their pre-war borders? Tell me that. Do they... In your idea, would you negotiate a peace where they get to remain occupying and conquering Ukraine territory? And then number two, he said one, one time when he was pinned down a little bit by a right-wing interview, he said, we can look at the aid and money we're giving Ukraine as leverage to end this war. That needs to be drilled down on. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Because what his solution is, is he's going to 
tells Zelensky, I'm going to aid. So Zelensky cannot prosecute the U.S. cuts off aid. Right. So that's his solution to end the war. Why won't somebody ask him about that? And also, he, and as you said, in terms of territory, he, he thinks of Ukraine as a shithole country, right? right. He, that's one of the countries on the list. So as far as he's concerned, oh, to on. annex this parts goes back, of Ukraine. No, no, more than that. This is personal for him. It's not the country. It's the perfect it's, phone call. It's the perfect phone call. <laughs> they double-crossed yeah. him. Yeah. They wouldn't. He got impeached because of Ukraine. Right. That's what it comes back to. He, he has a vendetta against Zelensky because you know he wouldn't he, prosecute he would, he hunter wouldn't, biden he wouldn't play, joe wouldn't biden play ball. yeah yep and that's what it, it's really all about it's so it's so interesting isn't it to kind of get in under the skin of this guy you really have to put yourself in his shoes and feel what he feels because he's that's a very it. insecure man you know he, yep. he is not a machismo character at all he not plays all. that part he knows how to puff his chest out but actually inside a little bit of him is dying every time you he know, knows the guy, how to he play really the character is, is the guy who drinks the water with two hands that's who he really is he knows how to play the character but inside he's a scared little boy you know and that really is where caitlin collins could have played him you know if she yep. was equipped then that's how you that's how you kind of expose him um on the, the on national or certainly on television Let's talk about another slippery character, if we can, because uh, you know, the Republicans are having a... This was actually a double, wasn't it? Because the day that Donald Trump um, got the Gene Carroll trial, George Santos also got some bad news the, the, the same day um, for lying to Congress and cheating to collect unemployment benefits that he, he didn't deserve. Uh, he said he won't drop his re-election bid. He's defied calls to resign. Uh, it was a 13-count federal indictment, a, a reckoning for a web of fraud and deceit that prosecutors say overlapped with the New York Republicans' fantastical public image as a wealthy businessman and his uh, fictional biography, which, which seems to kind of... It's one of the great resumes in history because he made it up. As an aside, when you talk about the timing... You yes. know, James Comer and Jim Jordan are the gang who can't shoot straight when it comes to timing of things. You know, they have this big press conference, which they've hyped for a week, you know, and all the right wingers were all excited about this press conference. Yeah. You know, the media and the left ignored it, but the right was hyped up. This was their big moment where James Comer was going to unveil all the evidence that they had uncovered. And his press conference was sandwiched between the E. Jean Carroll verdict, the Trump yeah. town hall, and the yeah. Santos indictment. <laughs> All happens within 24 hours, and nobody paid attention to Comer, which, it, it which reminded was so me, perfect. It reminded me of Rudy Giuliani at Four Seasons Total yes. Landscaping yes. when somebody in the audience shouted out, they just called it for Biden. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> he goes who did? And they're like, networks. Oh, the networks, the networks. It was like, again, you kind of, the, the, the timing was quite remarkable. Yeah, but well, what, you know. What's the deal with George Santos? The, the I mean, funny does thing he about, need to go? Yeah, the funny thing, well, there's the politics and the law. I mean, the funny, when I read the indictment, the most entertaining part of the indictment, and you know, there's this thing, and I get this from my followers, too, who, Because he's almost like a cartoon character. I mean, dislike him. They want him to go away, yes. But at the same time, there's not the venom there because it's almost like watching a reality show or something. Well, maybe because um, they've seen him looking rather beautiful in a dress. He, it's it's very hard to hate someone. I mean, I, I just feel he sorry. He's be entertaining. Really. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the funniest part of the indictment was that he was collecting unemployment compensation. He got $24,000 while he was making a hundred and twenty thousand dollar a year salary yeah. he claimed he was unemployed i mean setting aside all the stuff where he used campaign funds for spa appointments and clothes and you know all of that you know the brazenness of putting in for unemployment while you're making a hundred and twenty grand a year i mean 
I kick myself now for not putting in for those COVID relief funds. It's like, seems like everybody got all this money and then it all got forgiven. I thought you would, right. people were going to have to pay that back. So I didn't even try to get anything. I feel like a sucker now, you know, and you got Santos out there getting unemployment. <laughs> you know? On Friday, he came to an agreement with Brazilian prosecutors because a year ago he stole a checkbook and he bought some fifteen hundred dollar sneakers with these with these fake checks um and so he's uh, agreed to pay restitution and fines if prosecutors agree to drop the criminal case in brazil uh bringing a, a resolution to this case that has, that has tailed him for more than a decade uh, um and even the retailer's going to get money and the rest is going to go to charities can probably have to pay around five thousand dollars it's like it's been going on his whole life. I mean, a new thing, really. And he is a... He's also very ill. He's a fantasist. And the thing about politics is that there are no qualifications required to kind of be a politician, right? It's, it's, 